redeemed worship team. Lewis, great to have you back today. Thanks, you, Frank, for being here. Yeah. Well, let us, let us pray. Uh, gracious God, may we decrease and may you increase. And may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, a quick question. Has anyone here ever done something, said something, that a little while later you thought to yourself, I can't believe I did that? <laughs> okay, most of you. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, we'll talk after service. And uh, uh, you'll say, I can't believe I ra didn't raise my hand. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, there's, there's this, as I said at the beginning of the service, there's this great question that has, I've seen it, been, I've, I've seen it be asked uh, for almost my whole entire life. And as a pastor, I've been ordained for uh, close to 36 years now. Uh, every now and then, people, people come into the office and they'll, they'll say, I gotta get something off my chest. And they'll, and they'll either confess something that they, they've done or said or, or somehow they've hurt somebody or whatever. And then it always seems to kind of get to this point where at some point they will say to me, I just can't forgive myself for doing that or, or for saying that. And, um, and so that's our question today. Can I forgive myself? And so anytime we have questions, uh, I think life questions, uh, at least my, my thing for most of my life has been, well, let's turn to Scripture. See what Scripture has to say about that. Uh, does, 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 do the scriptures answer this question uh, before us today? Can I forgive myself? Well, we'll take a look at two stories. You can look, we can look at many, many more, but we'll look at two stories today. And the first one concerns David. And so, my namesake, David. And so, David, as you may remember, he, he's a shepherd boy. Uh, he's out there tending sheep, which was the lowest of the on the totem pole of jobs for the family to be doing. And then Jesse is his dad, and David is the youngest of uh, eight brothers, eight sons. There are eight of them all together. And one day, Samuel, the prophet, is coming into town. And, and he arrives, and when the prophet comes, oh, the town just kind of, whoa, oh, oh, what, whoa, what's going on? Are we in trouble? Because the, the prophet always speaks to the people for God. Anytime the prophet came in, ooh, there could be a little trouble for the, for the people. And so they're like, well, what's going on? Well, I'm looking for Jesse, says uh, Samuel. And so uh, he goes to Jesse's home. He says, Jesse, I'm here to let you know that the next king who will replace King Saul is going to come from your household. Jesse, can you imagine Jesse the dad? Well, I figured as much, you know, uh, my boys are good boys. Uh, and so he says, well, let's bring out your oldest son. So the oldest son comes out, tall, strapping young man. And uh, Samuel looks at him and goes, not him. Okay, all right, bring out son number two. Number two comes out. <coughs> nope, no good. And so he brings out seven sons. And each time Samuel, no, nope, not him. And then, this, to me, this is the, one of the funniest questions Samuel ever asked. He says, do you have any more sons? And Jesse's like, oh, yeah. I, I, I forget. Do you ever forget your children sometime? Um, <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Go get David. He's out there tending sheep. Bring him, bring him on in. So here comes David. Who knows how old he is? I mean, maybe he's nine or ten years old. And, he comes, and, and Samuel goes, yeah, that's him. He's going to be the king. And, of course, the older brothers are like, him? Are you kidding me? And he's like, well, and then Samuel says this, um, the Lord looks not on the outside, but looks at the heart. And this will be a man after God's own heart. So uh, David says, thank you very much. Appreciate that. I get to be the next king. But I got sheep to tend. So he goes out and tends sheep, and he's out there for another, who knows, five, six, seven, eight years. And then there's trouble in paradise because now we have the Israelites against 
the Philistines. And we have a guy named Goliath on the scene. And we know what happens. Uh, David, you know, what is he, 17 years old? He's like, I think I can take this guy. They, they've been at odds for 40 days that no one has gone out to, uh, to challenge Goliath. And here comes David. I think I can beat him. And they're like, well, and then what's crazy is King Saul says, okay, we're, 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 we're resting the whole fate of, of Israel on a 17-year-old. And, and King Saul's like, yeah, okay, let's go, go ahead. And so out comes, out comes David and, uh, you know, slingshot, slings, pff, cut, hits him in the head. Goliath drops dead. David goes over, gets the sword, chops off his head. I got him. I got him. Holds up his head for everyone. Everyone's happy, you know, and everything. But then, does that make him king? No, no. He's still just tending sheep for who knows how many more years. And then he becomes king. King, powerful position. You know, probably a whole lot of people not saying no to you. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people not saying, "Hey, David, you might want to think about this instead of that." Everybody just probably gets whatever he wants or whatever he wants. And he's, he's a great writer. He's writing the Psalms. He's singing and everything. And, uh, and one day, David's on top of, the, top of the rooftop, and he's kind of beholding, looking over the whole city. And then he's like, oh, hey, there's Bathsheba bathing on, her, on the top of her, her, her house. And he's like, I like what I see. So I think a um, uh, servant... Uh, Go get Beth. She, she's over that fourth house. Over, you know, bring her on over. So he brings her on over, and he commits adultery with her, and she becomes pregnant. Meanwhile, Bathsheba's husband Uriah is on the front lines. He's a soldier. He's on the front lines, and so David's like, "Boy, oh boy, I'm in a little bit of a quandary here. Bathsheba's pregnant. I probably shouldn't have done that." And um, hmm, wonder how we can solve this. I know. I'll get Uriah to come back. And so he's like, uh, go send for Uriah, have Uriah come back. And, uh, and, and since he's, he's been away as a soldier for a long time, when he comes back, he'll want to do what soldiers want to do with their wives when they get back together. And, uh, and so Uriah, come on back and uh, come into your household with Bathsheba. And then Uriah says, how can I experience pleasure when my brothers in arms are on the front lines fighting a battle. I'll just sleep out here on the front porch. And David's like, oh, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. So then Uriah, he sends Uriah back to the, to, to the front lines. And then he sends this message to the captain of the guards. Hey, when the battle gets intense, have Uriah come to the front of the line and everybody else just pull back and leave Uriah to be killed, which is exactly what happened. And so now David's like, whew, okay, we solved that problem. And then the baby is, Bathsheba, the baby is born, and the baby is stillborn. And there's a great amount of grief in all of that. And then, I don't know how much longer, a few months later. So this, you know, this whole thing, this planning and everything, has been going on for over a year now, right? This cover-up and all this kind of stuff. And then Nathan, one of King David's right-hand men, uh, comes to him and says, David, you're not going to believe what happened. He's like, what? He goes, there's a guy over here. He's got a little farm. He has one little lamb, one little ewe lamb that he just loves and he takes care of. And he's over here. And his next door neighbor has got like thousands of sheep. And the next door neighbor was getting ready to throw a party. And so he came over to this other guy, stole his lamb, and killed it to serve for, for this party. David gets irate. Who is this man that would do such a thing? And Nathan looks right at him and says, you are the man. You are the man. You're the one who stole Bathsheba. You're the one who did all this. And so, boy, David is overcome with grief. And he writes Psalm 51, which is, this is what, he, this is what David writes. And even, even in your Bible, it probably it would say something like this. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. 
And David writes this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. (coughs) Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. So, this is what David writes. And who who is he writing it to? Have mercy on me. O oh God, according to your steadfast, steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. I think that's the only time this phrase is ever used in Scripture. Your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Now, notice what David does not say. It's always important to see what people do say, but it's also important to notice what people do not say. Nowhere in this whole psalm does David say, well... I'll be glad to uh, start my activities again as king after a three-month sabbatical where I will spend time forgiving myself for this grave thing that I've done. Does he say that? <coughs> Not at all. Because it, it's, it's, it never, never in Scripture will we find anywhere where it says to forgive yourself. We're called to forgive others. And that's kind of, the cross is a great example. Forgive others horizontally. But then vertically, who do we go to for forgiveness? God and God alone. It never will we find any place where it says, forgive yourself. Because it's God who does forgive us. Um, there's this lady, uh, Beverly Engel, um, and she's a psychotherapist. And she wrote in Psychology Today... She wrote this. And if you go to her website, it's, it's all about self-forgiveness. I, she, this is Beverly Engel writing. I believe that self-forgiveness is the most powerful step you can take to rid yourself of debilitating shame. So self-forgiveness relies on who? Me. And any time, I don't know about you, but any time I have to rely on me, guess what happens? That didn't work out too well, Uh, you know? So uh, I don't have the power to forgive myself. I don't have the authority to forgive. I'm not set up as judge over myself to say, you're forgiven, David, and now you may proceed and lead the church or anything like that. No, I have to go outside of myself to God, who God alone is the judge and the forgiver, and to forgive us of our sins. I love what David writes. He says, blot out my transgression. We've talked about this before, that ink today, the ink that when we write something on, with an ink pen, it has acid in it, and it's the, it's the paper that absorbs the acid. That's why it's hard to erase uh, when, uh, something that's ink, so because it's in the paper. But back in the days of writing, you know, on the papyrus and on, on whatever they, they wrote on back then, um, they had ink that had no acid in it. And so when they would write, they would have to stop, and then it would dry. 
and then they'd write some more and then let it just dry on top of the paper. And if you were to blot out something, a whole sentence, you'd just take a wet rag, and it'd wipe right off. And it would look as if nothing was ever there before. And so this is what David says. Blot out my transgressions. Wipe it off as if it was never there. And who can do that? Only God alone can, can do that. What I love about, about uh, the fact that there's no self-forgiveness, the good news is that my shame, my guilt, your shame, your guilt, does not depend on your ability to forgive yourself. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on God. And as we do every Sunday, that's why we get excited when we do the prayer of confession and we do the assurance of pardon, because we are in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And everyone goes, woohoo, we are forgiven. We are set free. And I love also what, what um, David writes. He says, cast me not away, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. And then once you deliver me, he says, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh, Lord, open my lips. That once I've been forgiven, I am now free to sing and to sing your praises. And that is on my lips and all, all that kind of good stuff. And that's what we do. After we do the, the assurance of pardon, what do we do? We sing a song because we've been forgiven. And so, ooh, here we go. So that's one story. That's David. The other story is Jesus tells a parable, and it starts off like this. A man had two sons. And then he tells the parable of how the youngest son of the two sons one day says, Hey, Dad, um, I would like my inheritance now, and uh, thank you very much. And, what, and so to get an inheritance, what has to happen? Someone has to die, right? But to ask for the inheritance while, while the dad was alive... It is as if the younger son is saying, you are dead to me, and I want the money now. What's crazy in the parable is that, is that the father says, okay, if this t- t- typically happened in a, a Jewish household back in, in those days in the Middle East, what would the father have done? H- have you ever heard of the woodshed? You know, have you ever been taken to the woodshed? You know, not a pleasant experience. Um, And so that's probably what would have happened. I'm dead to you, son. Come here. And whew, not a pleasant sight. But the fact that the father says, okay, here you go. Gives Gives him his portion of the inheritance. And off he goes. Where does he go? To Las Vegas, right? Where else are you going to go with all that money? And then within a short time, he's done, he's done what? He's lost it all. That's why people only come here for three or four days. If they stayed longer, they would lose it all, wouldn't they? You know, and we're very appreciative of that because we have low taxes. And it's a, this is, Nevada is a great place to live. Thank you. Come visit Vegas as much as you can. Um, and so all of a sudden, he's without money. He's got to get a job. So he gets a job, and he's feeding pigs. Now, if you're Jewish, pigs... Not good, you know, no, no bacon for you, right? And so this is the worst of jobs for him. And so he comes to it, it says, the scripture says that he comes to his senses. And what does he say? Boy, you know, I really messed up. And I think I have forgiven myself and I will return and be welcomed by the family. Is that what he says? No, of course not. He says, Whew, I have really messed up. I will go to the Father, and I will say to him, I have sinned against you in heaven above, and if I could just be one of your servants. No, no rights, no privileges, no inheritance. Just if I could work as a servant, that would be great. And so he starts making his way home. And the dad on the front porch, you know, he's like, and he sees his son, and what does he do? He runs and, and, and Jewish men back in the Old Testament, they don't run, you know. Uh, it's, it would be a sign of, oh, he's gone crazy. He's running, you know. We're, we're, we're esteemed individuals. We, we walk. No, he's running to his son, hugs him, holds him, kisses him. Here's my ring. Here's my robe. Here are sandals. You are. And he's like, well, I've come here to ask for, for you're forgiven. 
You're one of the household. You're my son. You've restored. Come on in. Guess what we got? Big party. Come on in. Big party. You know, and so the son does. Now, does the son and does da did, did, did David ever think about what they had done later on in life? I'm sure they did. Sure they thought, I can't believe I did that. But praise God, I've been forgiven. And so uh, I, I say this a lot in church because it's the truth. I don't know where you are. I mean, I know where you are physically right now, but I don't know where you are spiritually. Uh, there's something you did two days ago, 10 months ago, 10 years ago, that still you just, you just you can't let it go. And God is saying, you're forgiven. There's no condemnation. Quit beating yourself up. Accept the forgiveness that I have offered to you. Because the longer I hold on to it, the longer I'm saying to God, no thank you. Your forgiveness isn't good enough. When it is. And then we can be like David and sing songs of joy forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. A gracious God, thank you for offering the gift of forgiveness. Thank you that you offer it to us over and over and over again. And for that, we say thank you. For anybody who's having a hard time accepting that gift, we pray that our, the, those hearts would be softened to receive fully the gift of being set free through the powerful act of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Weekend of our country's 248th birthday. Uh, sounds like a long time. You think about the church, been around for 2,000 years, and so we're thankful that we live in a country uh, where we can celebrate our freedom. We have freedom to worship, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom, freedom, freedom. So let's go forth in the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Love and serve the Lord with gladness and with joy. Honor all people. And laugh often and fear not. And go forth knowing that the unconditional love of God the Father Almighty, the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship, communion, and the power. The power of the Holy Spirit is with you now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Go get them.